Good campers, I am Leicester. No, I am not a city, that's my name. <laughs> if you're enjoying the music that you're hearing, that's good, because uh, I was the one that made it. Check out my music on SoundCloud, if you feel like it. <laughs> Shameless plug over, without further delay, I'm here at gunpoint to introduce this week's Benny Shakes Things Up. Without further ado, here's Benny. Except well, neither of us are Benny. Yeah, yeah no Benny today. <laughs> it's Benny, not Benny. Uh, I, 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 think this is, I think this is the first time that Benny's not been on co-hosting duties. No, I, no, he trusts me, Mark, to do it without him. <laughs> No, you 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 have not been trusted with this thing. Hey, hello, so, so, hello, hello so for those that don't know us, I am Mark Nicholas, and my co-host is Kate Lovelock. Or if you're listening to this on audio, it's Kate brackets the goat. As in the greatest of all time. Yeah, I think people know what the goat. Well, well actually, yeah, well, not everyone goat. knows what the goat is, Mark. I mean, I would just... By the way, Mark Mark has got the more awesome one. Okay, okay, story Next here. His name. Kate, Kate had <laughs> the awesome one when I streamed into Zoom, Zoom StreamYard, and then I put the more awesome one, and then Kate just ups the ante. Um, me and Kate have a bit of a rivalry because... Uh, just, uh, just a bit of one, yeah. Just had. And, you know, because we, 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 uh, we buy for Benny's love, basically. But yeah, basically, yeah. And, <laughs> Benny, and, this, I, Benny I, has I, created I, I, this animosity between it's all him. It's all on Benny, basically. So I've, uh, I, yeah. I think, I think you've, I think I've earned the love, but I think you've earned his respect a bit more. So. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And we also do, yeah, we do a show called Below the Belt as well. So please check that out, where we are team captains. And, Kate has um, <coughs> beaten me twice, but you know, because Ben yeah. gives up uh, Yeah, after the first one, he was like, Yeah, best of three. I was like, Yeah, let's keep going. Yeah, because keep I going. Win. Ben keeps giving you three points. That's fine. Um, right. Uh, okay. Because so I deserve that. them. <laughs> anyway, I think we should get on with the actual task in hand yeah. of interviewing our brilliant guest. Okay. Okay. So, so, all that aside, we have an amazing guest on. Uh, she's. Um, US comedian, uh, but he's doing comedy in the UK currently. Was previously a singer and has now gone into comedy. So uh, um, please welcome to the show, Barbara Fernandez. Hello, Barbara. Hello. Hello. Thanks for having me. Hello. How Hello. Are you today? I'm, I'm, I'm really good, thanks. My, my voice is like extra husky because I'm at the tail end of a cold. So uh, if I do cough, it's, it's not COVID, everyone. Uh, you know, okay. I've been saying that it's terrible. When I'm on the train and you start coughing, it's like everyone's looking at you. And, uh, yeah, I have to start wearing a like sign. You know? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> right. right. So, um, and uh, you've done any gigs recently? Yep. Uh, just uh, yeah, just just yesterday, um, I went to GMB Comedy, and I was I was originally there to accompany somebody else. And then that person wound up like not not being able to to do the gig, and so I went up to the promoter to Kyle, uh, Kyle Wallace, and I was like, "Hey, um, I just wanted you to know I was here for so and so, but you know he's he's not here today, but I'm gonna stay anyway." And then he was like, "Oh, you can open," and I was like, "Oh, okay." Fantastic. So, <laughs> Kyle Wallace is very nice on that. So also check out to yeah. Kyle Wallace, he's... big fat, big 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 friend of the show. Or big friend of the we show, talk, Carl Wallace. I think Carl we Wallace talk about him a lot. Yeah, Carl Wallace has been on this before, I think, as well. Yes. Oh, I definitely want to check. I definitely want to check that out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You check that out, and everyone else check that out. That'd be brilliant. Yeah, because he's um, he's he's very funny, and he's a he's a real character. <laughs> yeah, definitely but, in a good but, way. But, I mean, but then so but then so are you, Bob. But that's why we have you on the show. Um, <laughs> yeah, uh, yeah. So actually, we'll start. With the uh, so you know, we can ask you some questions about yourself. Start off with a nice, simple one. Um, so what is your disability or mental health condition? So, I have borderline personality disorder or uh, BPD for short. And as I say in my set, we Americans love an acronym. Um, so it's um, 
it's quite a serious uh, uh, <clears throat> it's quite a serious mental illness. Um, there's no cure, but it can be managed with the right treatment. Uh, but the right treatment takes a year and is very very expensive. So I um, yeah, so I like to be a bit of a how can I put it like a spokesperson for BPD to uh, to change some of the stigma around it because it's it's highly highly stigmatized in the mental health services. I could go on for ages about that, but I won't. Um, but I thought the best way for me to help change that stigma is to, you know, make it funny, right? Talk about it and laugh about it and sing about it. And then I can kind of like educate people sideways because um, one person who's really influenced me, I think he's probably my biggest influence for what I do now with my songs and stuff is uh, a comedian and actor, uh, Joe Tresini, who's absolutely incredible. He, uh, he does amazing videos about BPD on Twitter. And I saw his videos and I was like, oh, he's managed to make being suicidal be really funny. So, um, you know, I it kind of, I started cogitating and then, yeah, I came up with my first comedy song a couple of weeks ago. And so, uh, so yeah, anyway, BPD is what I, uh, what I have. The last year was, was um, pretty awful, if I'm honest. It wasn't because of the pandemic, but it was because that was the year that I uh, did the therapy for it, which is really intense because you're learning to uh, rewire your brain because in BPD what happens is that the the uh, the amygdala or the threat center of the brain is actually physically bigger than in most people you can see it on brain scans and stuff and it's bigger because of uh, perceived threat when we're young and stuff that part just grows and then the prefrontal cortex or the reasoning part of the brain is smaller you can see that on brain scans too so the part that reasons and says okay just because that person didn't text you does not mean that no one loves you and that you have to die, you know? Whereas someone with BPD, well, that's exactly what we think. And I joke about that in my song, you know, but but that is very much um, what it's like, yeah. So yeah, that's what, I, that's what I have. And I'm really happy that I have managed to come through the other side enough to do comedy about it because, yeah, I can honestly say, I mean, I'm sure I'm not the first person to say this, but I can really say that comedy for me has been a lifesaver, like a real lifesaver. There were times when I first started gigging. I mean, I've been gigging for about four months, um, but there were times when I started gigging and I would go to, I would go to gigs just not wanting to be here anymore. Like, and then as soon as I got to a gig, you know, and I saw the other acts and, you know, I was laughing and stuff and I did my bit, you know, everything was fine. It really allowed me to just like step out of myself and get out of my own brain, you know? That's kind of a long answer, but yeah. No, no, it's, it's a great answer. Great answer, it's amazing. Um, so I suppose the next question following on from that is how does it affect you day to day? Oh yeah, so so it doesn't affect me so much now day to day, but I sing about this where it's kind of like, now that I have control over it, it doesn't affect me quite that much. But before it was, oh, I wouldn't wish it on my worst enemy because it's kind of like, um, it's as if your emotional thermostat is busted. So the slightest thing can set you off with any emotion, not just sadness, but anger or fear or shame or guilt. So, and you never know when it's gonna hit. So it's a bit like, um, it's a bit like being on an emotional roller coaster, but the roller coaster is run by a sadist and you can't get off, you wanna get off and you just can't. And you know that mm -hmm. feeling when you, you get to the top of a roller coaster and you're, you're really, really scared and you know the drop is coming and there's nothing you can do about it because you can't get off. It's a bit like that. Um, and it's like up and down and up and down and up and down and up and down. So for example, with bipolar, people can have, you know, they've got the, the, the manic stage and the depressive stage and each stage can last for a day or a couple of days. With BPD, those stages can go from one to the other in a matter of, you know, seconds or minutes. Um, so for example, <clears throat> that was a really good example actually. For example, um, just last night, uh, when I, after I finished the gig at, at GMB, uh, I said goodbye to, and, I, and I, I had been coughing at the break and stuff and I hid in the toilet so I wouldn't make too much noise. Anyway, so when I left, um, I, I said goodbye to Kyle and, and he just looked at me with a kind of serious face and, and he said, get out. And I immediately, my, my, I left, I got scared, I left and my brain just started going down a spiral and thinking, Oh, he doesn't like you. He doesn't appreciate you. This is what happens. People, you can't get too close to people because then they always get mad at you. You know, you might as well die. It just goes down that spiral really, really fast. But 
now I'm able to catch it when it starts. And then I think, no, 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 wait, let me check the facts. <laughs> I, when I look at my past interactions with Kyle, I know that he cares about me. I know that he's a kind person. I know that he's, he probably wasn't mad at me. It's probably me imagining something. So then I thought, well, how can I check the facts? And then I messaged a friend and I was like, hey, you know, and I explained the, the you know, with the coughing and I said, do you think he was mad about that? And she was like, no. And so I did message him and I said, oh, if I disturb the atmosphere with the coughing, I apologize. And, you know, when you said get out, I thought you might be mad. So I thought to myself, you know, I just, all I can do is apologize if I have offended him in any way. And then he responded and he was like, he was like, no, I just, I just really wanted you to get home you know, to get home and look after yourself because I was worried about you. But of course, my brain interpreted it in a completely different way. So, yeah. you know, and somebody who doesn't have BPD, like in that same situation, they might, they might just say to Kyle, what do you mean get out, you know, and, and like laugh it off and stuff. And then they would ask straight away. And then Kyle probably would, you know, responded in that moment. Oh, I just want you to go home because you're, you know, whereas, yeah. you know, our go-to would be, oh, I'm worthless. Oh, no one loves me. Oh, life isn't living any worth living anymore. I might as well die. You know, and it happens so quickly. Yeah. yeah. So I hope that explains it. And it's it's. No, that, I mean, we're, that, that yeah. explains it. Yeah, the, the suicidal thing is a, a pain in the neck because sometimes, um, you know, I used to wake up and just not want to be here anymore and not know why. Like I couldn't, I couldn't tie it to an event. I couldn't tie it to. It was kind of like, yeah, just just waking up and feeling just absolutely awful, but with no reason. So that's where it was kind of like it felt like someone was playing Russian roulette with my my brain, you know. So it's um, I mean, the thing about BPD that I find well interesting, yeah, is that it can affect like five to six percent of the population, which is roughly double that of people with schizophrenia, but. Lots of people know about schizophrenia. Lots of people don't know about borderline personality disorder because it's quite difficult to diagnose. It gets misdiagnosed a lot. And I was, for example, I was only diagnosed last year. <laughs> um, people thought my whole life that maybe I had depression or maybe I had, you know, something else. Um, and so if you don't know that you have it, you can't get the right treatment for it because the treatment I got for it is called dialectical behavioral therapy, DBT for short, um, which is the most scientifically proven therapy for BPD. So if you don't get the right diagnosis and you don't get the right therapy, like sometimes people just grow out of it, but I didn't. So, yeah. Well, I mean, to be honest, okay. yeah, of all the guests we've had on here as well, it's um, you've explained that in a lot of depth and hopefully people will have more of an understanding. Um, apologies on the video. I think Kate's <clears throat> um, disconnected for a bit, but... We will we will pass a bit, and I'm yeah. sure she'll join us at some point. Probably loose connection, loose connection as if it's connected. <laughs> yeah, as if um, it were a wire, right? We could just yeah. <laughs> yeah exactly. Um, but you, you you mentioned about uh, comedy, really sort of. Uh, you feel better uh, when you uh, perform comedy. How did you get into comedy? Oh yeah, so this is really weird. Like, I, I think it's weird. I mean, when I was little, I, lo I always loved performing, right? And I wanted to perform. So my mom, bless her, she brought me to dancing lessons and singing lessons and acting lessons. And, you know, I did tap dancing and ballet and blah, blah, blah and all this stuff. And then when I, um, and then when I started doing theater, I have a theater degree and my favorite kind of theater was improv comedy. I just thought it was fun. And I used to watch, when I was at uni, I used to watch stand up comedians like, um, I don't know, Richard Pryor, and I'm trying to think of some other people, Joan Rivers and other people. And I would think, I can't do that because I can't remember jokes. Like, you know, like knock, knock jokes, or, you know, people that, you know, those people that like, they remember jokes at a party and they'll whip out like 10 different jokes. Like, that's not me. I couldn't remember any of them. Someone would tell me really funny jokes and the next day, like, whoop, you know, all gone. So I just decided in my head, and now I know why, right? Cause, but I decided in my head, oh, well, I can't do that. Um, you know, I, I, yeah, I can't remember jokes. So let me do something else instead. And then I, <clears throat> so then I started singing uh, professionally in Paris and I did that for, um, yeah, I did that for a couple of years along with a whole bunch of other jobs. I've had 30 different jobs um, alongside the singing. And then, and I really enjoyed singing, but, or, and um, at one point I, I really wanted to help people. Like I wanted to do something that would touch people at a deeper level because I did enjoy, you know, like 
standing at piano bars or at parties and singing, you know, I will survive and all that stuff. It was really fun. Um, but yeah, I wanted to do something to help people without having any clue what that was. Anyway, long story short, um, <clears throat> when, um, when the pandemic hit and when I started my dialectical behavioral therapy, um, I said to my therapist, like one of the first things you do is you set life goals. And so I said to him, I said, well, I want to use my talents to, to help people. And he was like, oh, I know what, I know the perfect place. You can, um, and so I, well, you can go to this uh, charity, which is called Body and Soul Charity. They're in, uh, in London in Islington. And they, well, basically what happened was I started hosting, co-hosting a weekly live stream. So throughout the pandemic um, around mental health, around um, dialectical behavioral therapy, we didn't call it that. We called it um, emotion regulation skills because, I mean, that's what it is. Um, that's a whole separate topic. But in a nutshell, it's basically like practical skills to handle intense emotions that can really benefit anybody. So they started doing these live streams because, you know, all these students in student accommodation who were trapped in their rooms were going nuts, right? So, you know, really, I mean, going nuts. What I mean by that is, you know, experiencing extreme emotions without knowing how to handle them. So, so we were teaching them skills to, to be able to do that. And that was really cool. And then while I was there doing that, on two separate occasions over two days in a row, one of the members of the charity was like, oh, you should do comedy. Like I was just telling them about weird stuff that has happened to me. Like I've had all kinds of weird things happen in my life. And, you know, some of it's in my sets. Like, for example, when I lost my first husband to Scientologist. And I mean, now I laugh about that because I think it's quite funny. But at the time, it wasn't so funny. You know, but anyway, when you tell stories, you know how like when you tell stories to your friends and you want to make them laugh, right? Like we all do that, right? We tell talk about something that's happened to us and we're like, blah, 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 blah. And, you know, we're unconsciously just want to entertain them. And it was when I was doing that, that they were like, oh, you should do comedy. So this was last year. This was in like, when was it like February or something? So then I, I said to my, uh, I said to my therapist, I was like, oh, I'm thinking about doing stand up comedy because my original reasoning was, well, it'll be something new. I love performing. It'll be really, really, really scary. Like I love performing and I love speaking in front of people. I'm not afraid of that. I just get like excited, nervous in a good way. But comedy inspired like terror in me, the thought of doing stand-up comedy. So I thought, well, that's a way to grow, isn't it? Um, but I but I didn't want to do an online course. And I knew who to study with. One of my friends had studied with my teacher, uh, Logan Murray, who is a fabulous, fabulous, fabulous London-based comedian, right? He's trained loads of people. Um, anyway, he was running online courses. And I was like, oh, I want to do it live. So then his first live course was in June of this year. Um, and I signed up to that. And then I, <clears throat> and then I thought, oh shit, I should probably read his book. Right. So before I do the course, then I get more out of the course. So I bought his book. I read his book. Um, he has a book called getting started in stand up comedy. So I read the book and when I did the course, I was like, I started to understand that there are actually, there are actually principles to writing comedy and I'm an ex teacher. So I think in principles. So I thought, oh, this is really cool. Like I can, I can actually learn how to write stuff that's funny. Like, you know what I mean? Like I knew that I was funny before because when I did theater, like I knew, I knew I had a sense of comic timing, but I had no idea that I could actually write anything funny myself. And I had done spoof songs before because when I had a raw food business, I did uh, like, for example, I did Katy Perry's I Kissed a Girl song, but my business was raw vegan food. So my song was, my version was I Tried It Raw, you know, and I was like singing about that. So I knew how to do those. I knew how to do those things, but it never occurred to me that yeah, that I could just you know really do comedy. And then, so I did the course in June, and then we had the, and you know for me, like I say, when I when I started the course, I really wasn't thinking, oh, I'm going to be a comedian. I was thinking, I'm going to do something scary, you know, to to grow as a person. Mm -hmm. That was my. So we did the course. We then we had the showcase on the last day of the course, and um and I didn't invite anybody because I thought, oh, if it sucks, I don't want anybody to see. And then in the end, my, my kids came, my kids are in their twenties. Uh, cause they, they found out I was doing it. My son found out and he's like, Oh, I can come. And then I was like, Oh, all right. And then my daughter found out, Oh, I can't invite him and not her. So they came and it went really, really well, the showcase and they loved it. And they thought I was funny, which is a lot, right. Considering they usually tease me about being a Karen, and, you know, like I'm not a Karen, you know, you know, anyway. So, um, my, uh, so Logan had said during the course, he was like, before the course finishes, you want to book yourself a couple of gigs because once you've done the showcase, you're going to be raring to go 
and you're going to wish you had some gigs booked in the calendar. And I didn't believe, well, I didn't, I was like, no way am I going to want to do any gigs, but I'll book the gigs because I trust him. Right. So I thought, okay, do as the teacher says. So I booked the gigs thinking, well, I can always pull out. Right? <laughs> Makes me laugh about it now. Right. But yeah, so then after the showcase, I did my first gig at the Cavendish Arms in uh, Southwest London. And that went really well. So I was like, oh, I guess this could work. And it was really fun. You know, it was really fun and I loved it. And that was that. Like I got my video from that gig. I used that video to get other gigs. And then, and then I thought, this is like the ideal world for me for performing because I, I can still use my singing in there. At first, I just inserted little snippets of songs in my comedy because I thought that would be fun. Why not? And then, um, and then, yeah, a couple of weeks ago, I I woke up and I heard the melody to my BPD song, which I think is definitely for me is like the I think it's the best song I ever wrote. Um, you know, co comedic or not, because I did used to write songs before, but but not comedy ones. So um, so yeah, and then now I'm like how can I put it all of a sudden like without meaning to I feel like for the first time I'm doing exactly what I'm supposed to be doing and I'm where I'm exactly supposed to be and I can't believe it like one of the biggest struggles I had before doing comedy was well it's gonna sound well tragic but it was uh it was I couldn't seem to find a reason to stick around <coughs> I'm being totally serious and I mean, I even Googled it and stuff. And, and I thought, well, you know, I have two kids, but yeah, they would still be okay. I'm probably more of a burden than anything else. And I thought, well, I don't really have um, an amazing career. I don't have, like, this is, yeah, like I say, before doing comedy, I thought, oh, I don't really have, um, don't really have that many friends. Uh, I have no reason to be here. And I honestly, I was looking for a reason to be here and I couldn't find one. And my therapist was like, well, what's important to you? And I was like, well, to me, it's really important to help people. And then he was like, well, how can you, you know, how can you find a way to help people that, you know, will give you enough of a reason to, to stick around, to stay on the planet. Um, and comedy gave me that reason because when I saw Joe Tresini's videos about BPD, then I thought, oh, I've always wanted to help people from, you know, for years. I've always wanted, like, I enjoy singing, but I don't like the music industry because it's very cutthroat. And I love performing and I love making people laugh. So all of a sudden I can, like, mush all those together into this really cool, like, casserole thing. And all of a sudden my life actually has meaning and a purpose. And I'm kind of amazed, really, because it's been such a circuitous route. Like I'm not in my twenties, you know, I'm, you know, twice the age of most comedians that are out there, but I mean, I don't care, you know, it's just, it's the perfect time is now for some reason. That's so interesting. That's so, so fascinating. Thank you. Um, so the next, the, our next question is, is based around that, uh, leading on from that in a way. Um, do you have a good support network around you? I do now. Yeah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. I do now, yeah. I mean, that's not fair. I did, I did before, but I couldn't really, I didn't really want to count on my kids as a support network because that's not fair to them. And and I was married for a long time. And, and uh, so we're like separated now, but we're on friendly terms. And so he's very supportive, but he's very supportive in the way that he, that he's able to be supportive. So he's very supportive. Um, financially and mentally and you know in lots of other ways but he's he doesn't have the emotional capacity to to provide the emotional support that I need which is why we separated in the first place so yeah I have that I have that now and yeah if I'm honest I don't think I always had that before because yeah also because I didn't know what was I wrong with me I mean there's nothing wrong with me but like I used to think I was broken. So before getting the diagnosis, I just thought, well, I guess I'm just a bit busted. You know, I just, I couldn't figure out why I kept splitting from one job to another, to another, to another, to another, or why I had these up and downs of emotions and up and down and up and down, why I kept changing countries. And, and this is the third country I've lived in. And um, so I couldn't seem to 
find how to make my life work. And it was just so frustrating. Mm -hmm. So having, yeah, having the right diagnosis and then getting therapy and then meeting other people that have it as well. And then, you know, now I have a whole bunch of friends, like, like through comedy, I've met loads of really cool people, really fun people. And all of a sudden it's opened all these doors that, you know, all of a sudden, yeah, I do have friends. I have low, I mean, I had friends before, but it's different to have friends who, you know, you can sing about BPD in front of them and they leave like singing the song in their head, you know, or even people I don't know. It's incredible. Like, oh, the stories I could tell, but I mean, I'll put it briefly. I was at a, I did a private gig and there were these, um, <clears throat> it was for a birthday party and there wasn't enough room to seat all the comedians at the comedians table. So it was about 70 people. So I sat at the table with the guy's church friends and I thought this is going to go well. Uh, my set is about Scientology and mental health, right? But they were so, they were so cool. Like after I did my set, like they asked all these questions. And so it's kind of amazing, you know, that, that, yeah, there is, there is support there. And it came from places I didn't expect. I just started comedy because I wanted to grow and then look what happened. Right. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. That, that's really interesting. I, I know this is the part of our question list, but something that's just sort of occurred to me. So if you just give one piece of advice to someone who's just got a BPD diagnosis, what would it be? Ooh, it would be do what you can to find a good therapist that specializes in dialectical behavioral therapy. And if you can't, I mean, we used savings to pay for it. And I worked like a crazy person to pay for it because um, it takes a, a year to six months. But on the NHS, they offer six weeks and there's like a two year waiting period. So if if it's a young person, there are charities like Body and Soul Charity who will offer the program for free. Um, so I would, yeah, I would look for a program and, and don't just wait for the NHS to do something. The NHS does a lot of good things but for mental health, they don't. And in particular for BPD, it's it's highly stigmatized there as well because they think we're, most people there think that we're um, uh, not able to be saved. And this comes from mental health nurses and stuff. So um, just keep looking for, if you really look hard for a support system, you'll you'll find it. And also um, there, are, there are really good YouTube videos around on how to deal with BPD. Um, I'm trying to think of a guy there's a really, oh, if I think of his name, I'll, I'll, I'll say it later, but, um, well, yeah. I'll tell you, yeah, tell you what, uh, when this video goes out, any links you want to share around BPD, we'll add it to, uh, oh, that would be great. Yeah. yeah. yeah any, anything you have on it, um, yeah. we'll, we'll put it in so that it can be, cause we want this podcast to be informative as well as, yeah, uh, there, there are resources. Yeah. yeah for people. Fantastic. Yeah. And the, the emotional the thing about, thing about dialectical behavioral therapy though that I find really cool is that the skills that you are that you learn are useful for anybody and they're I mean they're crucial for anyone even like you know for kids like how to deal with intense anger or how to deal with you know like kids go through puberty they're experiencing all these things and one of the most common things that goes with BPD is self-harm so you know you get these teenagers in in school who are self-harming because the pain is so I mean and I did that the pain is so bad that you 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 just want to get out, you know, get out of yourself and you don't, you don't know how, and these skills can help with that. You know, there was a, an initiative to put, um, to teach these skills in schools. Um, and it got crushed when David Cameron came into power. Um, but I just mentioned that to say that, you know, the skills are good for anybody. So dialectical behavioral therapy, it was started by Marsha Linehan and she had BPD and she, but at the time, like, nobody knew what it was and because she was a researcher and she was a very 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 intelligent person i mean she was literally in an insane asylum in new york banging her head on the floor and saying i'm going to find what out what this is and i'm going to help people who suffer like this and she freaking did so yeah there are resources you just have to look for them yeah amazing yeah um, do you want to take the next question kate I mean, I can take the next question, Mark. Uh, we're overtaking. I'm going to go to my question because mm -hmm. I have a very important journalistic question. <laughs> Probably one of the most important questions you're being asked today. And I'd really appreciate the thing. Mark hasn't heard this question before because 
in previous series, we have said, uh, I've asked people what their favourite biscuit was. Um, but I've decided to move on from biscuits. I've decided to go from sweet to savoury and ask, what's your favourite crisp? Or oh. potato chip? Oh, salt and vinegar. Absolutely. Oh, salt and vinegar. Salt and vinegar? Crisp. Yep. The oven Any particular ones. brand or just? The the kettle chips. Ooh. Yeah. Kettle I mean, Pringle, Pringles are tasty, but I know how junky they are. So I try yeah. to avoid those. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you quite like Pringles, don't you? I do like I, Pringle, though. As, as, I do as, like Pringles. Yeah. Pringles are amazing. I'm also feeling the love for Watsips. Um, you know, <laughs> except for the cheesy dust on your fingers. Not a fan of that. Yeah, I can't get on the uh, Watsips train. Yeah. But yes, thank you very much. <laughs> that was a very important question, and I'm adding Absolutely. it to the tally. Thank you. <laughs> if, by the way, if any of these brands want to sponsor many things, yeah, stuff, sponsor uh, us, please. We're open to sponsorship. <laughs> we'll do ads. We'll do ads. Perfect. Sponsored by kettle chips and what's it? Um, Emily Crisp is available at any store. Other crisps are available. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking, that's, what, that, that's what they say, isn't it? Um, okay, so after that really intense question from Kate, um, <laughs> sorry, it is a very valuable question. Uh, we want to make this a bit lighthearted as well. So, yeah. Uh, back to the more serious questions. Um, so I can like, do lighthearted. <laughs> over, so like over. I mean, yeah, like over lockdown. Did you suffer as a result of your BPD? Like, did that? Um, yeah. Did the lockdown yeah, I, your condition? Sorry. So did the lockdown? Say that again. So um, did, yeah. Yeah, because because. Oh, oh yeah, this is really weird. It did, but I think in the end it was probably a good thing. And I hadn't realized this before this very moment. So if you could see in my head, you would see this light bulb going <laughs> um, because uh, what I had done in my life previously was I had distracted by going out and seeing people and keeping myself really busy and working a lot and busy, 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 busy you know, because if you're that busy, you don't you don't stop and look at what's really going on under the surface in your mind and stuff. But I couldn't do that with lockdown, so I couldn't escape. So I had no choice but to just, which was really difficult, but I had no choice but to face what was going on. There was no, there was no, there was no distraction. I just had to deal with the emotions and do the skills. And because when you do dialectical behavioral therapy for BPD, you're given homework as well, because you have week, you have weekly one-to-one -one sessions you have group skills sessions once a week and you have homework and you have to like work on the skills every single day because you're retraining your brain. So I had no choice but to just work, work, work and, and kind of do a deep dive. You know when they say about pain that like you can move through the pain by not resisting it? A bit like that, but for for uncomfortable emotions, you know, and for for beliefs we hold about ourselves and all that kind of stuff. So. It was kind of a hot house, yeah, an emotional hot house. And I think the good thing about it was that, yeah, it just forced me to look at all that and find a solution because maybe I don't know if I would have gone through as deep of a you know shift as I did if I had been able to still distract by going out. You know what I mean? Yeah, I know exactly what you mean. It's that thing of it forces you to to. It's, it's that thing of, I know people who've said that the pandemic has forced us all to take a pause. And sometimes sometimes that they mean that really superficially, but I can see obviously with you that that's quite a deep and important yeah. thing to have had to do. So that's kind yeah, of, yeah, yeah. 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 I think that's yeah. really, really, yeah. Amazing. And the, the, lack of, the lack of social contact with people was, yeah, that was really, really, that was really, really difficult. And I remember... I remember afterwards when I when I moved to London, I said to my therapist, I said, one of the biggest things that I miss is having huggable friends, you know, because everybody needs a hug, right? Pandemic or no pandemic, it doesn't take the need away. So, um, and now I do have huggable friends. Yay. Yay. I do have my Yay. Yay. <laughs> As Mark goes, yeah. <laughs> yeah, because that, that's. That's really, that's really important. But it is little things like that, isn't it? Like, yeah, 
you had to social distance or wear masks and you couldn't have that social contact that actually yeah hugs hugs yep it's like it's a yeah, actually, I think hugs release some sort of endorphin anyway. But yeah, they I, do. Yeah, we have a biological need for for yeah. touch. Anyway, we're wired for that, so we're not. You know, we're wired as social animals, so it was very counter our natures to be, you know, shut yeah. away. Well, as more than yeah. one person has said, yeah. Mm -hmm. No, but it's, it's, it has been challenging for yeah um, a lot of people. Um, I did make the most of it in other ways, though. I mean, I completely changed jobs. Thank goodness. That was so good. I taught myself the technical stuff to do voiceovers, and I started doing video presenting, and I started freelancing online, So, because I used to be a supply teacher before that. So for me, you know, when, when people are like, oh, I just watched loads of Netflix, I'm sorry, I'm one of the doers. I didn't do that. I went running. Well, I had to go running because it'd be, oh, yeah, that was the other thing. Uh, oh. You know, because in the in the early days when you're first learning to deal with these intense emotions and stuff, and you're first looking at them, it's a bit like you know when you have a you know when you have a pot that's got burnt on bits at the bottom, and you filled it with water, and it's been soaking for years and years and years, and then you start to examine what's down there until you get a scrubbing thing, and you scrub at it. But before you can tip out all the water, you get a lot of gunk that floats to the surface, right? And you have to deal with the gunk. It was kind of like that, you know. So one of the ways that I dealt with the gunk was to um, go running. So I don't run now in London because I do lots of walking and also I don't really need to. But but at the time, like if I started to feel, you know, you could physically feel the emotion build. And one of the things we learn in, in, um, to deal with BPD is you learn your, um, your sequence of body sensations that leads to an intense emotion that then becomes out of control. So for example, some people that might start with feeling hot in the face and then all of a sudden like your chest feels tight and then you might start clenching your hands. And then for me, it's when it gets to that burning sensation between my eyes, then I know that's it. This is gonna be a, you know, a full blown meltdown. So, mm -hmm. so what I learned was, you know, as soon as you start feeling the beginning sensations, up, out for a run, or up, you take a cold shower. That was fun. Oh, because cold showers mm -hmm. activate the dive response in the body. So they help, um, they help calm. <laughs> Yeah, they help calm extreme emotions because then your brain, the, the blood rushes to the extremities and stuff, and it rushes away from, you know, the the, the brain. Which is, yeah. So I had to do that. That was really fun. Oh, I remember standing under the cold shower. I had to be at least thirty seconds, and it didn't, this isn't fair that I have to do this, but it worked. Yeah. Yeah, but anything to get through lockdown. Anything to. You yeah. know, try and manage that very difficult time. Yeah, um, but I mean, the good thing is it does rewire the brain. You know, we can rewire our brain for, for BPD anyway over time. It just takes a while. And then yeah. you don't have to, like, I don't have to take cold showers anymore unless <laughs> I want to. <laughs> Funnily enough, I don't want to. Yeah, I know. <laughs> shocking. Shocking. Yeah. It's the most shocking thing you've said today, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> I think the most shocking thing was, you know, you, you said kettle chips. I mean, that was a very controversial answer, I think. <laughs> was that a non-British answer? <laughs> no, no kettle chips are nothing. I'm, just, 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 I'm yeah. just winding Kate up for the question. Uh, yeah. So. yeah, I mean, it's more difficult to wind me up with the crisps question than it is to wind me up with the, ke with the biscuit question because the biscuit question would have a Jaffa cake every now and again. People yep. wouldn't like that. Ooh. And it's like technically no. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and that, that's a whole debate what the difference between biscuit and a cake is. But yeah, anyway, that, that, that is a conversation. Anyway, that's a that's a that's a past conversation. Past, 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 and future, past right. move on. Past right. trauma biscuits, no. <laughs> um, I've lost order of the questions. The you've way. lost you've lost the order of the questions. Well, we knew that was going to happen. Well, no offense. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> See, Barbara, this is, like when, this, when this is, this is just life, I'm afraid. <laughs> um, so the next question, I think, is have you ever been judged because of your um, your disability? For example, have you ever not gotten a job? And I know, obviously, your um, disability has a lot of things where you perceive things and stuff like that. But, I mean, in the respect, I, I suppose, categorically knowing would probably be a more sensible would be a more kind of 
categorically a, what? A question to ask if that makes sense. Cate sorry, categorically knowing that you've been discriminated against. Oh, right, 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 right. Um, no, only because I, uh, because I work as a, I mean, I'm quite lucky because I work as a freelancer, they don't need to know. Oh, okay. on on up it's it's on a on a an internet platform called Upwork, so I just go on there and bid for jobs, and I have my profile which I've written, and I might have you know a Zoom call with them or something like that, but um, I don't think there's yeah I don't I I'm quite fortunate I think because they, I mean all they care about is that I do my job you know I do my voiceovers I do my video stuff I do my and because I'm you know, I respond quite quickly and I'm, I have good communication skills and all that kind of stuff. Um, thanks to other stuff I've done. Um, they really, you know, they, they enjoy working with me and I've got lots of, you know, lots of nice ratings and everything. However, um, uh, how can I put it? I know, and I know this from many hospital staff that have told me and many people that I've asked, um, I know that if I were to go to 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 A and E or to and I sing about that in my song, if I were to go to A and E with, you know, um, I don't know, appendicitis or any any anything really, um, the fact that I have BPD in my notes, um, I'm ninety nine percent sure I will be treated differently, because what happens is, um, well, I'll give you an example. What one woman went there, uh, went to the hospital. She thought she had really bad stomach pains. And when they saw that she had BPD in her file, they thought that she was just asking for attention because the, mm -hmm. the stigma is that we're manipulative, we're faking it, we're asking for attention, we're very difficult to deal with, we're violent, oh, um, what else? Yeah, manipulative is the big one. And you know, I mean, there are like university professors that are teaching uh, mental health students that we are manipulative and that there's no point dealing with us. So people are being taught things that are not scientifically viable because DB, uh, dialectical behavioral therapy is scientifically proven to help like 83% to 92% of you know, people. Yeah. So anyway, um, yeah, I know that I would not be treated the same. They sent this woman away when they saw that she had BPD, they were like, oh, she must be faking it. And she had to be rushed back in an ambulance because she had you know, acute appendicitis. Um, and I, I asked, um, I've prepared a TEDx talk about it um, because I think it's really important. And I haven't done the talk yet, but well, you know, lockdown and stuff. Um, but what I did was I asked people as well on some uh, Facebook groups, people who have BPD, and I asked them, you know, what were their experiences? What are some of the things that people have said to them? And I mean, it's just unbelievable. Like there's everything from you people shouldn't have children, um, yeah, you people are, are, are faking it. Um, what you have is, is untreatable, you know, go away, stop bothering us, stop wasting the NHS money, like horrible things, really horrible things. So I do believe that I won't be taken as seriously because I have it on there. But I think for me, it's, it's, it's more important. My principles are more important. So, and because, because I know that, um, okay, how am I gonna put this? There are lots of people, like millions of people with BPD in the UK right now who are who are suffering, 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 who want to die every single day, whom no one is helping because they don't have the money to pay for a private therapy. And six weeks on the NHS after a two-year waiting period isn't going to cut it because the brain needs to re literally shrink the amygdala. You can't do that in six weeks. You just can't. So, you know, to, I'm really passionate about helping those people by changing the stigma around BPD. And I think that because I'm, you know, because I can be a well-spoken person, because I, you know, I'm not, I'm not a millennial. I like to think that people could see me differently. So um, for example, I went to, um, <laughs> I went to a, uh, <clears throat> I went to a course, a training course for uh, mental health workers who wanted to learn how to work with people with BPD. My therapist um, asked me if I would come and do some acting there and stuff. And so he um, he showed this video that was des that was designed to like provoke severe emotional reactions. And I was fine with the video. I was just acting because I could control myself by then. But I pretended to cry and get all out of control and da 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 da. 
And anyway, long story short, like no one came to, you know, help me or support me. I was sitting in the room amongst all of them, crying and crying and crying, and no one, no one did anything. And then he he came and got me and took me out of the room. And then mm -hmm. um, and then he, he brought me back in and said, right, I would like to present everyone. Uh, this is Barbara, and she is an actress, and she does have BPD, but she was acting for us today. And they were all absolutely shocked, A, because they believed me when I was acting, and B, because, yeah, they didn't, where was their compassion? Which was, of course, the whole point of him doing that exercise with me. Mm -hmm. He wanted to show them that, you know, you say you have compassion. Here's somebody next to you in distress and you're too scared to, you know, to help them out and stuff. So I think that I could be a good public face for BPD because I, um, I did a lot of coaching and other things, which means that I, you know, I like public speaking and then I have the whole singing comedy thing. So I like to think that I could go to mental health. My goal is to go to mental health conferences with my, with my comedy, with my stand up and stuff like that. So that people can see that, Oh, there's somebody with BPD who, you know, acts normal or who is, you know, entertaining or who who is literate, you know, who can hold a conversation, who is funnily enough not manipulative, you know? But it's um yeah, and I think it's why, you know, we I wanted to get you on here tonight because I remember you spoke about your BPD to me briefly after a gig once. Yeah. I was just like, yeah, I think it's really important for any mental health and disability, and this is why Benny sets things up, is really, yeah. um, hopefully we'll give people the platform to do that, to yeah. to try and destigmatize um, certain mental yeah. health conditions and disabilities. Right, we're going to change tack a bit slightly, and uh, we're going to do a little game with you. Are you up Oh, I love games. Okay, yep. So... Um, <laughs> Me and me, Kate and Benny, no, is a very good friend of ours who does a lot of online comedy uh, called Jamie Priest. Now, Jamie uh, has something called. Uh, so, so, Jamie's got several pools. Oh, I know right? Jamie, yeah. Oh, so you know Jamie. Right? Yay, so, friend yeah, of the show. Yeah. Yeah, brilliant. So, he's, he's got. Um, uh, or he uses what's called an augmentative. Communication. Um, Alternative and, communication, yeah, AAC device. Yeah, AAC, yeah. Yeah, AAC. Uh, I always like, I don't want to get that right. Uh, but he basically does, uh, he communicates through symbols and they normally have words underneath. Now, what we're going to do, we're going to show you, we'll just do one because I think we're running short of time. Um, we're going to show you a group of symbols and you have to guess what the phrase or sentence is. Okay. Does that oh, sound good? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Jamie is really funny, by the way. I remember he's very funny. He's, yeah, he's Jamie hilarious. Reece, definitely check him out. He's absolutely brilliant. He's anyway. very funny, yeah. But yeah, here is... Oh, so, yeah. So here's the first one. <laughs> well, here's the only one. We're going to just do one. Animal. It's an animal? No, so um, it's a phrase. Oh, a phrase, okay. Is it like left to right? It's left to right, right? You read it left to right? Yeah, left to right. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, oh my god. It's a very um, yeah. I'm trying to think of top Go. I don't know. Up top here. I'd always I tired. would always start with the last thing and then work backwards, yeah. even though it's supposed to go left to right. Okay. Oh yeah. So I'm gonna say tired. Um and it's a phrase. And each symbol is one word, right? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Um if I'm honest, Mark, I wouldn't have picked this one for someone. It's a very British phrase. Oh, yeah. Oh. Maybe do it I'm dog one. tired. Yeah. Bat shit crazy? Yeah. No, bat. <laughs> I love the fact that it's what you went for. Um, yeah, maybe this one then, yeah. Okay. That. That. I don't know. Bat topless. I don't it's know. easier than you think, this one. Don't overcomplicate this one. Bat stick, bat, bat shirtless. <laughs> I, like, I like the fact you're, you're concentrating. I like the fact that you're concentrating on on the on the on the, the, the how many clothes they're wearing. It's great. <laughs> um, yeah, that, uh, I don't know. It's a flying. I don't know. 
it's, it's, well, a, it's, it's, it's a, a fair, it's a, it's a, it's a well-known, it's, it's a film. Oh, it's a film, Batman. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. Oh. And, and, and just just yeah, let's your, do, um, let's do this one. I was going to say, so the first one was Get On Your Bike. Oh, you are, that that's a tough up? one. Do you have huh? get, on, get on your bike. No, what is that? I mean, I it basically I, I means get out. Get it, means, it means oh, yeah. It's all, it, when you say get on your bike, it means leave. Which oh, I, I always think is a that. bit rude that we. It's very rude that we write that, that that that's the one we get our guests to do. <laughs> I'm like, okay, yeah, yeah. get on your bike, clearly, and that's why we leave. Get it on your bike until we end the show. <laughs> we leave it till the end because we like to say that. Um, but yeah, no. So that yeah, I look. I just clicked on the things Benny gave me. That's all. I, yeah, sure, sure, Mark, sure. We'll blame yeah, Benny. Yeah, okay, cool, brilliant. Right, so Marvel. <laughs> I mean, I'm not sure what happened there. I oh, think I don't Benny know. Was... Oh, we press buttons. Right. <laughs> Let's get on with the very important questions. Now. With the questions, yeah. We've Let's got get two back more, to the questions. I think. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but my, my, the next question I've got, um, this is a very, this is a question that with B Benny it has a lot of context in that there is the the thing around being disabled and and getting life insurance. But the thing is, when I say it, it sounds slightly like I'm trying to sell it to you. Um, have you got oh, life could, insurance? It, <laughs> no, I think it would be very expensive. And if I tried to get, if I tried to get health insurance. Yeah, that's that's a problem actually. If I tried to get health private health insurance, it would probably be astronomically expensive mm. because of the BPD. Yeah. Um yeah. so that wouldn't even be yeah, no. Yeah. Life but insurance, it would be it would be the same. I mean, oh yeah, this is actually really important. It um well, I want to say anyway. Okay, I mean, BPD is so stigmatized that often what happens is when when psychiatrists see um, young people, like like teens or young people that have that meet the criteria for BPD, they often give them a different diagnosis to avoid them having that label. So they give them they yeah they literally will say oh you're bipolar or oh you have depression or oh you have ADHD or oh you have PTSD because they don't want them to carry the stigma of having BPD. That's so bad. That's how bad it is. Yeah. Awesome. I mean, yeah, that's how bad it is. Yeah. I mean, I, I was just about to say with the life insurance question is it's it's quite shocking the amount of the things you have a disability or mental health condition. Suddenly life insurance is through the astronomically yeah. high. Yeah. But, but, yeah. but then I, I think this has been such an eye opener about BPD. I honestly I didn't realise how badly I knew it was stigmatized from it's the hell. It's, you know, briefly, it's living but, it's living yeah. hell, yeah. And it's also like the hard thing about it is that you can't see it. So that's why people think you're faking. Like, like now I, I mean, I know what it feels like to be so, to be so upset emotionally that your whole body hurts, like your whole body's in pain. Mm -hmm. And it feels like, it feels like, um, in its worst moments, it feels like you're in a prison and you can't escape it because the prison is, you know, inside you. You just, there's nothing you can do. There's no place you can go nothing would make a difference you'd be on a beautiful beach it would be the same it would just because it's your brain just firing off all these chemicals and all this stuff and um and i did ask um because a lot of people are uh, who have it they can't work or they can't work full time I, they're you know really incapacitated because you know they're hypersensitive to everything i mean they're just like you know crying in bed not wanting to be here unfortunately because there's such a stigma and people think we're faking it it's very, 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 very difficult, next to impossible to get any kind of like, you know, benefits or any kind of disability, you know, um, funding with it. It's just, it's very, very, people fight for years to get it. And most of the time they don't get it because like I say, people think that we're faking it and they think it's not real or yeah, they just think, you know, oh, buck, you know, stiff upper lip or buckle up or whatever you might say, put a brave face on it but it's physical. You can see it in brain scans. And even though you can see it in brain scans, they still won't accept that it's something that unless you get the right help for it, some people do grow out of it, but most people, you know, some people don't. Yeah. And yeah. Um, 
it's it's been such a, an informative discussion. I, I think we both have learned a lot. Uh, but I just yeah. want to finish off with a. Shall I do the last? Uh, yes, of course, Mark. Yeah, yeah, yeah. This really, well, we always like to ask our guests this. It's a nice, well, it could be like hard or it could be serious, depending on how you take it. What would you change if you were president? Um, of this country? Um, I would. So, actually, to know, what is it if you were. I think it's president of whichever country you like or the world. I'm going to yeah. say the world. I'm going to say the world. I would definitely, definitely make you know, not only like physical health care, but mental health care free for everybody. Definitely, definitely, definitely. There's nothing more that I would, because there's no point having, you know, having a lot of money if you just want to die all the time, you know? Yeah. Or if you're in severe physical pain, like, like I'm quite lucky because I, I feel for people who have, you know, severe physical challenges because I mean at least I mean well mine was treatable it took a year and it took a lot of money like you don't even want to know how much money like it was it was literally like paying rent every month but just for therapy so um but then there are some people who you know they can't afford to do that or they have something physical that can't be fixed like that you know like I don't know somebody with fibromyalgia or you know some other things that yeah so I, I consider myself lucky in, in that regard but yeah that's what i would do free mental and physical health care for you, you, everyone you have you have two brits here who very much approve of what you just said and all our, yeah every, every one of our listeners will approve of that um, yeah I, I think healthcare being free is so important i mean we're lucky in this country yeah, yeah. That we have we, we have, have we have a certain amount of free. oh yeah i'm yeah, gonna be honest agree, and say yeah. everything's a certain amount of free health care but we need more of it yeah, yeah, at least it's better here than it less of it these days. Yeah, you were telling me, Mark, weren't you? That yeah, it's 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 not what it used mm. to be. I and I, and I and I know that. But yeah, for some things, it's really good. When I had both my kids, you know, the NHS was was brilliant. So I don't want to sound like I'm ungrateful, but at the same time, when I think of those millions of people who are suffering every single day, I just sometimes I'm just like, what the hell can I do? And the only thing I can do is just share my stuff far and wide, you know. And you know what, that's a really, really lovely note to end on, actually. Um, yeah. And if you want to check out uh, Barbara's... BPD My BPD song. song! It's YouTube, if you're seeing yeah. this on video. Mm -hmm. uh, it's a YouTube link below. If it's audio, uh, we will put the YouTube in the link to the podcast when we share it. Uh, just very, very quickly, is there anything else you'd like to promote? Barbara, while we're uh, here. that's the that's the main thing i mean i do do a lot of gigs in in london so um if, if people want to find where i'm at you know you can go to twitter or instagram at barbara's voices uh i have to say because i'm excited about it that this friday i finally get to do laugh able yeah laugh able comedy laugh able in ilford yeah <clears throat> and yeah i don't know why i did that because as, as we just talked about this before this is going to go out at a later date but check out when we share this on wednesday laugh able tickets uh will be available there and they're free and barbara will be performing uh and it's gonna be yeah we've got a lot of amazing acts uh yeah, it's gonna be really fun yeah yeah it's gonna be yeah. such a fun night and it's a christmas special so the person who comes with the best festive jumper will win a special prize so definitely yeah. check that out <laughs> if you want to uh donate to buy any one of us a drink go to paypal.me slash benny shakes all the also will be going to the acts and don't forget to like share subscribe uh to the podcast if you're watching on youtube ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos mm -hmm. um <laughs> yeah, I'm so smooth, so smooth. Um, but yeah, thank you very much, Barbara. This has been really fascinating and amazing. Oh, well, thank you. It, and thank you for giving me the platform to, you know, talk about it, about something that's so important to me. So yeah. It is, it is yeah. absolutely our amazing. pleasure. Um, but yeah, check out me, Kate's personal Facebook as well, Kate Lovelock and Mark Nicholas, Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Insta. Okay, bye everyone. Bye, 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 Bye. Bye. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm afraid that's all we have time for tonight from Benny and the gang. 
Please remember to subscribe and click on the bell for more notifications on the next instalment of Benny Shakes Things Up. If you want to support the podcast or you like the jingle from Leicester in Nottingham, please click on the links below. Adios, amigos. <laughs>